Hello. Hi there. How are you doing? Good. Um, can you do me a favor and type your name into the chat in your company if you want to be associated with the company, just like so get it correct on the attendee list? Yeah. Thank you. And hey, Tommy. Hey, Tom. Hey, Manuel. Hey. Hi, Heinz. Good morning or good afternoon. Sorry. Uh, almost afternoon for me, anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, Jojo, um, what's your last name? Actually, you, I think you've been on the call before, haven't you? Uh, been once, yeah. Uh, that's what I thought. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's Baldwin. I put on the chest. That's my full name. Okay, Baldwin. Okay. Okay, because I thought I remember the name Jojo before. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Klaus. Hey, Doc. Morning, Ginger. Ginger, are you there? I am. Good morning, Doug. Oh, good morning. Morning, Colin. Good morning. Hey, Scott, how's it going? Morning. Hey, Mike. Hello. Morning, Ray. Hello. Hello. Vinay, are you there? Uh, Mark. 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 <laughs> it's been a while. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, I assume you're probably deep in the in the move or something like that, right? Uh, that that has been part of the challenge. Yeah. Your. Uh... Ooh, pretty. That's that's a shot out my my um, office window. Nice. Morning, Jeff. Hey, good morning. And morning, Jim. Good morning. There was someone else there. Oh, Nacho, are you there? Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Vinay, are you there? I wonder where Colin, I'm oh, not Colin, Colin. <laughs> Clemens, let me ping Clemens. Do -do -do. Morning, Eric. Good morning. Ryan, are you there? Uh oh, I think we lost Ryan. Doo -doo -doo. You gained Clemens, though. And there is Clemens. Yes, we gained a Clemens. You can ignore my Slack message to you. All right, it's three after. Let's just see if I get everybody, then we'll get started. 
I think so. Okay, we'll circle back around and play that guys later. All right, status. Um, so it's interesting. So we still haven't actually written up a chart or anything for a SIG because we couldn't figure out what we wanted to do yet. However, the workflow subgroup that we have is trying to go forward to the sandbox project and the TOC is trying to figure out um, which SIG should actually review that going forward. And they're bouncing back between SIG apps and SIG runtime. And I don't think either one's actually a very good fit to be honest. So I put a comment out there that maybe we should just bite the bullet and create a SIG serverless for these projects that don't really quite fit. Um, haven't heard back from them yet. I'm going to ping the TOC on that thought. So if you guys um, have any opinions on that, you know, join the thread in, in the issue that was opened up in the TOC for the workflow uh, project. Um, but I just thought I'd let you guys know that that may be coming to a head soon. All right. Uh, Jam, just a slight reminder that you have an AI and Clemens, just a little reminder that you have an AI down here. And when you guys get a yeah, chance. I, I spent all the cycles uh, this week on the on getting the subscription API document done. For, yeah. In, in, in shape for you all to look at. Yep, that's what I figured. That's why I didn't bug you, but just a reminder to you guys. Um, let's see, thank you, Ryan. All right, do, 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 SDK. So we do, oh, community time. Um, anything from the community that people want to bring up that's not on the agenda? All right, moving forward then. SDK call, we do have one scheduled for today. Um, immediately following this call, I don't know if they have any topics to, to talk about, but we will, we will at least have a very brief call right after this one, just a reminder for people. I don't see Kathy on the call. Is there anybody else from the workflow subgroup on the call that wants to give status? Okay, I don't see anybody or hear anybody. All right, so let's jump into the PRs. So <clears throat> Mike, let's go to you first. I assume you don't wanna look at the old doc, right? You just wanna look at the PRs? Yeah, I mean, the doc's probably out of date at this point. Yeah, that's what I figured. Okay, so hold on a sec. All right, anything you wanna bring up just up to date? people so if you want to go to um the, the thing at the bottom that big table we added last night do, do, do. this stuff yeah um so like there's there's a question here that i would like feedback from folks on is is trying to bundle this stuff up into one api call useful should we make it two api calls so where um you know, this, this first one here of discovery with expand sources equal false, it's equivalent to like, tell me all the producer type tuples that you know about. Um, whereas the expand source is true gives you down into like, hey, what are the sources that I uh, can actually can actually get at? Um, uh, if you look at through the comment history on the PR, you know, Doug had put together an example of like how things could like wildly get out of control. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm worried about here as well, is if you are actually letting discovery be sort of a directory over the sources that you have. Uh, and again, I'm thinking about, you know, building a intelligible UX, whether it's CLI or UI here, where, um, again, you can imagine somebody goes in and clicks uh, the, you know, the four or five services on your platform that they subscribe to. Uh, they go, you know, go into the storage one, they see the different lifecycle events for storage things. And when they click one, they're given a drop down of all of these these sources that they could subscribe to. Um, so uh, that seems to be how a lot of existing systems work. What's the what's the scenario that you're trying to what did you trying to solve in the first place? Because I would think so. I, in in my mind, the um, the completely automated discovery scenario where you effectively you you're doing something like a DNS style lookup is more important than how that's displayed in the UX, frankly. Not sure I follow what, what an automated so, so lookup would be. So, so for the discovery mechanism, I would think I would think that I walk up that I walk up from programmatically to a repository and I have a few criteria that I that I have and then I get back a list of um, uh, subscription managers effectively, which uh, are providing those those elements, but I'm not sure there's always human interaction here. 
I think in that case, if you have all of the information, I know I know the the source, I know the type, um, the discovery would narrow you in very quickly to a subset of valid places to send subscription requests to. Um, I guess I guess maybe that's a question that I assume we are answering is if we're trying to solve the human interaction case, um, which I, I think if you look at existing event products in the marketplace tends to be how this is done. Whether it's going through AWS Lambda and clicking a flow or Google Cloud Functions. Um, apologies for not being as familiar with Azure Functions. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm looking for I'm looking for a mechanism that allows me to resolve a um, a type of event to an address where I can go and, and and get that kind of event with with some further criteria. But the UX is something that is from from the scenarios I have in I have in mind not so not so important. So I'm wondering I'm wondering what the input scenarios are here. I, I, anybody else on the call would like to comment on, on what we should be solving for? I guess I'm, I'm not 100% sure I'm following Clemens. I think what you're saying is you want to walk up to a, to a discovery endpoint and say, I'm looking for this particular event type, right? Yeah. Is that not what Mike was allowing for down here? It's just you, you get other information, like it's coming from GitHub as opposed to something else. But if you're looking for get that pull request, the output of this would allow you to get that information, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want I, I just wonder what the data format is. I think that's like the 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 way how this is displayed is something that I find difficult to, to difficult to, to standardize. Oh oh you um, want this. You want yeah. to see the like the JSON output. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah because you know because we have if we're displaying these things, we're gonna in in, in Azure, we're gonna display those uh, as we do this um, for every service, for everything in Azure, and there's gonna be a particular style of list, and we're gonna do this in a certain way. Then the AWS folks are gonna do that in their style, the IBM folks are gonna do that in their style because these are all things which are happening in the context of greater portals, etc. So everybody has a way to go and, and deal with deal with that, and that's something that is. The, the, the decision of how those things are desi designed are so far away from, from me as a service owner that I don't even get to influence that. So, so, for, me, so for me, that seems like a, trying to standardize the look of it is an uphill battle that is, uh, that is difficult, but, but standardizing what the data structures look like. Yeah, that, sorry, that this, is not, this is not standardizing the look. This is, this is me being lazy and instead of getting you like <laughs> <laughs> lines and lines of JSON output. I'm trying to get something that's a little more human consumable for talking about oh, this. Okay, sorry. So then I'm just <laughs> <laughs> so imagine that each one of those lines in that table is a, uh, a you know like a JSON structure that contains all of the attributes to find further up in the doc. All right. So I misunderstood that. Sorry. No worries. Yeah, that was my assumption. I, I I thought this was interesting from an understanding perspective, but yeah, I wanted to see this part, and I figured that was just a point in time snapshot of where Mike's head <laughs> is at. If, well, so so if, if people agree with this like human readable thing and like we agree on the concepts, I will go write the JSON, which is a you know much more of a pain to do. <laughs> so I'll make sure we agree on the concepts and then I can do the, the detailed work. Okay. But I, but I do think Mike's original question is a really good one for him at this at this stage, which is he basically has a single API. Let me see if like where is it? He basically has a single yeah. API. But then he has an option that says, well, do you want me to expand it or, you know, or not? Where this is the non-expand version, but then if you expand it out, you're going to start seeing duplicates because it's, it's the, actually, no, it's not going to do it. It's just this part gets expanded, which could be really, yeah. really large. Well, and it, and it could be expensive too, right? So if, I, if I'm providing an events broker for an entire cloud platform that has, you know, 80 or 100 products, and uh, I have to go through and expand for each event type. Now, uh, that per product expansion may only have to be done once server side. Um, but like, there's a question about what level should you see this detail? So it would be fair to think about this and, and like try to do it in one universal API, try to do it in two, or even, even try to do it in three, where like I can only get those sources expanded for a single producer event type at a time. 
Um, so I know some of the folks on, on, on the Google side that are thinking about this are concerned about performance and the ability to go get this data. Um, and, and, and really that's, that's another fundamental question is, are we providing a generic facility over discovery of, of valid sources? Because like if, if you look at event providers, oftentimes that's a criteria for the subscription. So like I can't go to GitHub and say, hey, give me all pull requests that I care about. I have to go say, give me pull requests for repo ID seven or, or whatever their ID, their ID structure is. And having the facility and the discovery of knowing which, sort, which repos I have access to is an interesting thing to think about from a, like a human interaction place. We have, some people, with, yeah, we have some people with their hands up. So Ryan, I think you might have been first. Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, I, I, I share the concern about performance um, because the number of sources could potentially be unbounded um, and returning them all contiguously in a single result set for all producers um, uh, might, might get a little bit unwieldy. Um, so uh, what, I, what I was thinking is, is maybe thinking about this in a more restful way, um, uh, where instead of you know, query parameters, there are you know, sub-resources of, uh, um, of the um, within the URL um, that would, you know, scope the, the sources to a particular producer or, or type. Um, at least that, that's how I was thinking about it. And you could, you could potentially expose an endpoint where you could uh, uh, get a more broader set of, of sources that um, maybe functioned more like a, a search endpoint rather than a rest endpoint. Um, but just my thoughts. No, that's really good. Thanks. And Jem, I think you're next. Yeah, and I guess I was sort of thinking the same thing as, as you guys were talking. And, and I wonder if this would be better represented as, as a GraphQL style endpoint, because there could be so many different ways that you might want to query this. I think it becomes really problematic you know, to try and enumerate all the different access patterns through, through a classic sort of RESTy style interface. Um, so you know, modeling it in terms of the entities and how they're related and then exposing that through GraphQL so that you can then query it in whichever way makes sense to you might, might be another option. Yeah. Huh? I think that's a good thought. Yeah. Klaus, you're next and then I'll go. Yeah, so I mentioned it already in the comments uh, in this uh, PR. So I wonder if the term producer is the right one here. It confused me in the beginning. Because uh, in our terminology, we have defined producer as, uh, quote, the specific instance process or device that creates the data structure describing the event. So um, you proposed, Doug, I think you proposed this term uh, source type. So that, I don't know, I found that more intuitive, I have to admit. Okay. I was going to comment that, Mike, I know you and I were talking last night and this, this sort of seemed okay to me then, but the, the more we're talking about, the one query that I'm a little unsure of is how do I just get the list of types regardless of the producer or source or anything else? And it may not be that big of an issue if the if if there's only one producer per type. Um, sure. But if you well, have lots can, of different can, producers, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly think about different ways to hold this, right? If we need that, if discovery is a collection of APIs instead of a single API, like that's a possibility. So you could imagine like say, hey, give me all the types. And from that, I might also get all, I'm just gonna use producer because I don't have, we don't have a free to fun term yet. Um, I would have a list of producers that might have that particular type. Yeah. Because in, in the end it matters, right? Like, I, yeah, I want storage, storage, you know, object create events, but whether I'm getting that from Google Cloud Storage or from S3 matters, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was, the only reason I was, I was thinking, I agree with you. I was just thinking slightly differently in terms of what are the events that this guy is going to shoot out at me? <clears throat> and then I can go figure out, okay, who's actually producing them. But because when I actually subscribe, yeah, I'm going to want, you know, AWS versus Google versus IBM, even though they right. all support the exact, the exact same type. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I think we're assuming that they'll all have the same type, but. Yeah, I know, different. <laughs> well, from it's the a pipe dream. From the subscription API perspective, because. So the subscription and so the subscription manager is what we call our thing that is responsible for managing subscriptions and um, ultimately also for distributing events. That's the, 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 the 
that's the entity that you tell that you want events, and it's also the entity ultimately which is responsible for getting the events to you in some way. Um, I think the discovery mechanism is uh, one, certainly one of the roles of it is to resolve um, a uh, you know, input criteria to the endpoint address of a subscription manager or of subscription managers. Um, and so the, I might actually come in with criteria that say, here's my, here's my GitHub repo address, which is the source. And here's my type of event that I'm expecting. Please give me the network endpoints where I can go and subscribe to those kinds of events. That's the resolution step that I'm expecting out of this, the discovery mechanism. So a, um, and I like, and I also like, I like the, the graph, the graph QL idea to basically make this a graph because you can, you might come with different kinds of criteria, uh, which may be based sim in the simplest case on source and type, uh, but also may have all kinds of additional criteria, which are metadata that is uh, describing the source uh, more uh, closely rather than just the, uh, the URI that it is. But that's kind of the, from, from, from how we set up the, the subscriptions API, we have a reliance more or less on discovery to do the work of, of providing that level of, of lookup capability so that it ultimately resolves to a network, to a network URL. Yeah. That is also so the subscription manager. In the way, even in the way I got things currently specified, if you had that level of granularity, I've got the source and the type, it would give you the information you need to create a subscription. Um, uh, but that, do, that doesn't mean that, I mean, I think what I'm hearing now is that, that we need to think about how to, how to hold this a slightly different way. So, um, but I hear that use case as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me that what we really need is for people to comment on the PR about the exact uh, set of uh, flows or data path that they expect to follow to get the information that they need out of the system. Right, um, you know, like for example, Clemens, you wanted to start with with type or maybe source or something, and then you, from there you wanted to get obviously ultimately to the URL you're going to su submit the subscribe to. But in order to get to that right URL, we need to know the exact bit of data and the order in which you want to traverse it. Right. Um, so it seems like we need people to comment on there. So so Mike can use all that as input to figure out whether it's one query versus multiple queries or or whatnot. Right. Yep. Yes. Or if people want to just like ping, ping me on Slack, yeah. um, happy to have a conversation or video chat one off. Yep. So let me ask a slightly different question. I, obviously, this is a, a really large issue for us in the spec and um, it needs to get resolved at some point. But is resolving this issue a blocker to merge in this pull request? In other words, can we merge the pull request today? Um, and assume that we're just going to iterate on this through additional PRs? Or do people feel like we need to resolve this first before we even have the first draft as a markdown file in our repo? Because so I'm inclined to say, I, let's, I'm inclined to say we merge, but go ahead, Jim. Yeah, no, I was about to say, I mean, I, I, I haven't looked at this one in, in its current form in the repo. I mean, is, is it so covered in comments that you, you can't really follow it? I mean, I think that's, that's where I tend to get lost with big PRs. Yeah, mm, I don't think so. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think really most of the comments, or if not all the comments, are really relatively minor in scope, more like syntactical kind of things. I mean, if, if people want, what we could do is I don't think there's any real rush, um, but we could wait till next week since we didn't warn people we we're going to possibly merge it this week. We can give people another week and then do, the, do an official yay or nay next week on the call. Well, and, and I think, you know, we wait, wait until next week. Um, it's reasonable for me to have a, something slightly different to look at next week. I, I don't know if it'll be GraphQL or not. I'll have to go learn some things. <laughs> okay. But I, I, I think whether it's GraphQL or not, I mean, you know, uh, and I can't remember who it was. Somebody sort of was suggesting a more resource centric um, model. Um, so whether it ends up being GraphQL or, or just a more structured 
a resource style model. I mean, I, I think you still need to have uh, a view on what those resources are or what those entities are and how they how they map to one another. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, I've done it very flat right now. Um, yeah. Just, uh, just taking some notes here. Okay, so it sounds to me like we may want to wait one more week. Mike, you have some things in your head that you wanted to yep. do, but then maybe we can look at um, possibly merging it next week as just a baseline to, to keep moving forward. So, um, so everybody think about that. We don't obviously can't still choose to wait and not merge it next week, but I think it'd be really nice to get a rough draft like this in there because I think um, I think it's starting to shape up really nicely. And Ryan, your hands up. Oh, sorry, I meant to lower it. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just plus one that. I, I think I, I'm sure a lot of other folks are in the same boat, but haven't had a whole as much time as I would like to spend on uh, looking at these things. So another week would be appreciated from my side. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, I, in case it's not clear, because I know there are times when for new people on the call, it may feel like sometimes, depending on how things work out, it may feel like we're trying to rush some things, even though we only meet once a week and we have these deadlines of, you know, I have to get changes in by Tuesday and stuff like that. It still could sometimes feel like we're rushing things. So if at any point in time, anybody wants more time, please do not hesitate to raise your hand and ask for more time on stuff. Uh, Scott? You know, we, we could always uh, merge it and then, because we're not cutting a release, or, uh, we could create issues and erase questions and make PRs uh, at this thing. Because I, I think it's, uh, it's a little hard to uh, help edit this text when it's in PR form. Yeah, that's, that's one, of the, one of the reasons why I was thinking maybe we merge it this week, but I think we've heard enough from enough people that either Mike wants to make some changes or people want a little more time to review it. And we didn't really warn people that we may merge it this week. So I think out of fairness, we'll give people one more week if that's okay with everybody, but then we'll, we'll try to push for merging next week. That way we have that baseline. Does that sound fair? Good to me. Okay, I don't hear any objection. Okay, thank you, Mike, for all the work you put on yeah, this. I appreciate it. No problem. And let's switch over to Clemens. I assume you want to start with the doc itself, and not the open API. Clemens, you want to bring people up to speed since I think you just put this in yesterday. Not too many people probably had a chance to look at it. Uh, yet. Well, I updated. I I put this in on Monday, I think, and oh, then okay. I I did a. I think the I I updated the I added the. Um, Open API document yesterday. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so this is effectively just the markup version, more or less, of our cleaned up markup version of the document that I had um, uh, shared. Um, you can read this yourself, and you should. Um, <laughs> um, basically, this is um, if you scroll, and I think I talked through this already, but just to, to get people, remind people. So we have a, a bit of a notations, uh, notations thing, and then we have we defined what an event subscription is. I cleaned up some of the, the terminology. Um, in particular, I think I mentioned that on the last call um, where I clarified what we mean with pull style and push style delivery, that's kind of at the bottom of the screen right now, um, where, you know, there's a, where, say in, ver in, in a more wordy way, what we mean with pull and push, Pull means the consumer solicits the delivery um, versus this on the other side, the subscription manager initiates the delivery, this push, push style, um, and they're typically a little bit different in terms of how they're being set up because for allowing the consumer to the solicit delivery, you need to have a particular protocol model and you need to have gestures for that that are anchored in the protocol. And so subsequently underneath this, I'm, I'm explaining those uh, mechanisms. The goal, the, the reason why we're making the, the difference is um, it should be ultimately this, this, the, this whole discussion is about conformance. What the goal is here is to allow someone who builds a cloud event solution that is just using an MQTT broker or just using an MQP broker or is just using Kafka. Um, all of those should be compliant because those are pops up infrastructures to some degree. Um, um, it should be possible to build a pops up solution just with MQTT, which means 
we need to we need to have a, a house that's big enough for MQTT and MQ, MQP to fit in, but then also for a subscriptions API to fit in um, that we are defining here, which is for you know, this push style delivery where um, we're effectively having some software entity that we configure and that then calls out into webhooks and delivers events. And that's something that's obviously a little different than, than an MQTT or MQP broker. So I'm, I'm trying to build a house that's big enough for all of those things to kind of coexist and to be able to, to claim conformance with um, the cloud event subscriptions API or subscription mechanism because um, conformance is um, in many places, in many industries, a thing that um, customers look at. And ultimately, um, this is about interop. So that's why I'm, why I'm making the house a little bit bigger and, uh, and have effectively two, two, if you will, competing uh, definitions of what a subscription is. So I'm, I'm enumer enumerating the ones for MQTT, MQP, NATS, and Kafka, um, which have those mechanisms. So let's scroll down. I reworded, I cleaned up some of the wording that we had in the initial word draft. Um, and I also mentioned that HTTP does, doesn't have that and therefore um, we need to have an API and here I'm now describing what that API is. First in the abstract, um, define what the subscription object looks like, um, has an ID, defines what the protocol, delivery protocol looks like and then refers to protocol settings which are further down. The sync is uh, the property that holds the, the network address effectively. And then we have filters in the following sections. Then we'll have, we have the protocol settings. If you scroll a little bit further even. Um, so these are the settings for, that exist for HTTP. Um, I am, uh, I'm probably gonna kill the proxy. So I, I'm, not, I'm not completely done with this yet. Um, I think the proxy URL and proxy credentials, even though we discussed those, I think I'm going to toss those because those are not uh, per endpoint considerations, I believe. Um, but they are rather um, per considerations of the subscription manager per se, um, which means they're not in the right place here. Um, and, and if so, I would have to have them for MQTT and MQP also for the WebSocket binding separately. So um, I, I rethought, rethought that and I'm probably going to go and drop those still. Um, then for MQTT, we have the, the necessary settings or for MQP we do. Um, and then for Kafka and for NATS. Um, the then we have the filter dialect. We want to allow multiple kinds of filter dialects, potentially even a SQL style dialect, et cetera. But um, the one that we're gonna define as required is the simple dialect here, which allows you to do exact match, prefix matches and suffix matches. Um, and then we're defining at the bottom what those, um, um, what that filter, uh, the filter is, and then we're having some a few examples of these um, filters um, in here. Um, okay, and that and follow then follows effectively all the API operations that we have. Plan is I'm describing create, retrieve, query, update, and delete in the abstracts here. Um, so what the create operations should do. Um, the goal of doing this in the abstract and not doing that just in the open API document is that um, uh, we also want to have, um, certainly for MQP, um, which allows you to kind of create these sorts of APIs, we certainly want to have um, a, a also mapping um, um, so that um, you can go and effectively manage relationships of that sort also through an MQP interface. Um, so the create operation um, uh, obviously creates a subscription, then retrieve is a simple get, um, and then put down query is obviously a get for multiple, and uh, then further down we have updates and also uh, deletes, um, all defined in the abstract. And then there is an HTTP binding, and the HTTP binding is listed here as TBD, but there is a open API document that is in the other documents. Yep. You are doing this so well, Doug. Um, 
which effectively describes the um, that AP, the, the HP mapping of that API um, um, as I've defined it. So that's already the mapping most of the error conditions um, has the the subscription object um, already mapped in the schema section. Um, so effectively, everything that I've specified in the in the narrative in the spec is um, um, already in this open API definition. And with my, with all, oh, as I'm just seeing with my uh, trademark uh, TEH typo that I always make for the um, at the bottom. Oh, there so, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do. I do this. I do this. All, I, I, if the document is done long enough, I do this. I do this very often. Um, so that's that's effectively what I what I what I have, and I would ask for you guys to start looking at this. I think the most content, ultimately, I think this the the open API definition is going to be the most contentious one because um, I, I think that some of you already have some sort of uh, subscription API where you can go and, and configure a push uh, mechanism. And I would love to, so this is an initial, so look at this as an initial proposal. And this is something that I even look, I even did um, ignoring any prior art we have at Microsoft. So I literally just, we, we discussed this, we came out with, with some, with some um, object model, and I just put that object model into an open API, an open API def, definition without looking at the right. Um, and um, if you, if you already have something like this and you have a subscription API, I would like for you to take this as a proposal and, and, and effectively compare this against what you have and then um, to uh, make suggestions on how we can go and change this. That said, um, I think it's most productive and that's also a comment on the other document that since these are working drafts that we just go and commit those as they are into the into the repo and then handle those with comments on um, with with issues that might actually be the, the more productive way of dealing with this than rather than you know, having a single PR hanging around for the longest time and having 10 discussions break out on different parts of that document. Yep. All right. Thank you, Clemens. So I think the proposal here um, is to see if we can uh, merge this one next week, you know, let you guys have another week or so to look at it and look at it. Um, but in the meantime, are there any questions or comments for Clemens? Nothing? That is quite unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect most people haven't had a chance to look at it yet, so. Okay. <clears throat> I only got a chance last night, so I apologize for not doing it sooner. Okay, well, I'm not gonna force you guys to look at it now or anything, but obviously take your time to look at it. The goal here is to try to, to merge both PRs next week. So unless you guys find something pretty significant, um, we should probably assume that we're gonna try to do that and then work them through issues and pull requests and stuff like normal. Okay. Any last minute questions or comments on either document before we move back to the rest of the agenda? Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys very much for putting together the drafts. Um, hold on a minute. All right, cool. All right, so now let's get to a really easy PR first. So I believe Nacho, you proposed adding a, a link to the Google Cloud Pub sub binding for cloud events. Yes, that's right. Very easy little PR. Okay. Any objection to doing this? I believe it meets the criteria that we have. Any objection to approving? I'm sorry, what was that? Let's, let's add it. Okay, just want to make sure. All right. Also, awesome. merge that later. Thank, Thank you guys for that work. I appreciate it. Approved. Thank you. All right. This PR, I believe, is actually closed. So we need to talk about that. So this one. So we talked about this PR last week, and this is the one about how to determine whether someone should even try to parse a binary message as a cloud event or not. And in the HTTP section here, let me hide these. 
But we talked about this text last week and there were some minor wording tweaks. I think we actually reviewed the minor tweaks last week and everybody seemed to be okay with that uh, general direction. So I made basically the exact same textual changes in uh, AMQP, Kafka, MQTT. I'm not gonna push the merge this today because I just made the changes about an hour or two ago. So there's not enough time, but it is basically the exact same text. The only change is things like properties versus headers, depending on the protocol. But please take a look when you get a chance. Um, I would like to merge that next week. Hopefully it should go straight through, but please look at that when you get, when you get, look at it, um, sorry, when you get a chance later in the week. Hopefully that'll be easy. And I think that's it in terms of open PRs. So let me open it up. Are there any other topics that people would like to bring up on the call for discussion on anything? Okay. In that case, we can adjourn and we'll jump over to the SDK call in about a minute or two. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk again next week. And please do review the um, the open PRs for the draft doc for the draft specs. Thanks you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank bye. You. bye. All right. Do, do, do. Let's jump over to where is it? <clears throat> hey, Mark, you're still there, right? Yes, I am. There, while we're waiting, there's a PR. I wanted to get your take on it. Where is it? In here. If you get a chance, can you take a look at this one? Um, yep. Luke wants to have the make file pull down a binary um, from some website. And I'm sure it's probably perfectly safe. I just personally get really, really nervous to pull down an executable during a make step um, that people may not realize is gonna happen. And if something obnoxious gets into that binary, it could do some nasty things to people's systems. Yeah, um, it, it, it's, yeah. Answer but I no. could just be paranoid. That's why I wanted to get your take on it when you get a chance. Yeah, all, all the random binaries on the internet are safe. <laughs> oh, is that the way it works? Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the correct way to do this is to check for the existence of that uh, binary and run it if it's available and leave it up to individuals to install either the binary or from source as they like. But it should issue a, a, a it should issue a warning saying the binary is not available. Uh, can't do, can't do uh, link checking. Do you want me to comment back on that? I would love it if you could. Yeah, just to get someone else's take on it. And I, and I like that idea a lot. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now SDK call. All right. What topics do you want to discuss? Code signing. Co co signing. Code signing. So we have a real problem um, that uh, needs to be discussed here because I think we need to have a solution, and I don't know what that solution looks like. Um, .NET requires um, code to be so. There's a, there are two levels of code signing. There is a strong name, which is effectively binding the the assembly to the owner through a private key, which is sort of a, a code signing thing, but that's just a, a public, um, public private key pair mechanism. And then there is obviously code signing um, outright. Um, so authentic code. Both, both of those mechanisms are um, fairly popular in the, in the .NET space. 
Um, and the strong main mechanism is something that is um, actually required for many runtime environments. And if you don't have a strong name, then the code is not going to be executed. So that, that is um, enormously picky when it, when it comes to that from a, from a security perspective. Um, so now the problem is, I don't know that I can just go and make up a key, a key pair because the code is not ours. And it's not clear that Microsoft <coughs> would be authorized to even be in possession of that key. And that's true for, that's true for a certificate, for, for a proper code signing certificate, as well as for those private, private keys. So theoretically, that would have to be neutral infrastructure um, that is CNCF owned um, and, and CNCF run that allows us to do the code signing. And we have so we're, we have brought, we have brought this up kind of through our channel um, with uh, um, CNCF folks, but I'm not sure we have a we have a proper solution for that yet. So Thank ultimately, you. ultimately the goal is um, I, I'm currently so we're currently building um, the um, the assemblies out of this repo through the pipeline I set up. And ultimately, the key that's being used to sign would have to be managed by the CNCF. Theoretically, I can't manage it. And you're talking just about the case where we want to be able to make the binaries downloadable someplace, as opposed to asking people to build them themselves, right? Yeah, because they need to be so. So for 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 the for the the, the bits to be usable, they need to be um, in. For Java, they need to be in Maven, and for um, no, mostly, um, and for .NET, they need to be in NuGet, which means they need to be uh, in available in the package package managers. Otherwise, um, that's just not working with most people's um, uh, workflows. Would would we need to make sure that the build is done <clears throat> by the CNCF as well, or or does uh, or, or one of us allowed to actually do a build? I'm worried. What I'm worried about is what I'm worried about is really the protection of the private key. Yeah, I, I I get that, but I'm just wondering. I understand the code signing. I I understand. I think I understand the code signing problem that you're describing, but I'm also just wondering that you know to say it's signed is one thing, but who, but if don't we need to verify that the person doing the build actually built what they said they were supposed to build as opposed to some virus? Yeah. So exactly. So that's that's the that, so that that is now that is now the interesting problem. And I don't know. I have no insight, and I don't know how the rest of the the um, how the rest of the world in CSCF is doing that how, is doing this with SDKs. But but if we have binary, so we can punt and we can say, well, we're not going to have binary distributions, and say you you got to go and sign your own thing. But then we're obviously having the problem that everybody's going to build their own binaries, and ultimately someone's going to go and sign them. So which means that that for for us to be able to put something into into um, NuGet, we have to and to be able to use it in production for Microsoft. Um, that assembly needs to be code, uh, needs to be signed, and then it would be the it would have to be Microsoft dot a Microsoft dot namespace, and then it's you know it's no longer CNCF. So there's there's a there's a there's a, the, the the concern is not technical, but it's really one of ownership, and then since it's owned by the CNCF, there would have to be some infrastructure that is owned and managed by CNCF that protects the private key and that probably also um, executes the executes the build. Uh, well, why would the way you're discussing, what you're discussing is likely being solved for Kubernetes and other yeah. distributions. So we should figure out what their best practices are around that. Isn't your code signed Apache 2? So you can have a local mirror and sign that copy. It, well, you, 
Uh, ultimately, ultimately, uh, we need to have one. We need to have one assembly or one, um, you know, jar file in in Maven and in NuGet and the package managers. And we need to have ultimately, if we have a Java JavaScript API, it needs to be an NPM. And that needs to be ha it needs to have a signature, right? Mm -hmm. And so that needs to come from one source. The question is, where is that? What, where is that one source? And so who's managing that? So the CNCF has a CI/CD thing, environment, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Have you reached out to them to find out whether they're able to use that to do the build? And I'm sure they must be able to store private keys for this type of thing in their system. I have, I have, I have not. We're, we're also, I'm, I'm bringing this up because that's an active discussion that we're, we're, we've been having, or okay. we are having. Um, if, you, if any of you have, have ideas about this, but you don't. Well, other than try to leverage their CI/CD system, now I don't have anything. Yes. So, so that system is is um, probably what we need. We need to learn about what that is, and how that works, and how we can make that thing, um, you know, pop out and then publish packets. Because ultimately, ultimately, I would want to I would want to go and tag a release. And then that CSCD pipeline needs to run and needs to start running, go and create a signed package and then go and upload the package to the package manager. But I, I want nothing to do with the secrets and the credentials that are being used to go and do that upload. So Scott, are you gonna have a similar problem with the Go SDK? Or is everything you're, you're producing simply vendored in? Yeah, it's all vendored in, there's no binary. Like when you do a go get, it does a build locally. Yeah. I would imagine Java might have the same problem though, because they're going to produce jars, right? Yes. Yeah. Java. Java's going to have the same problem. So can we assume that you're taking the lead on trying to figure out the solution for .NET that we can just replicate it for Java? Well, yeah. <laughs> 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 Punt. <laughs> I mean, this might be the first instance of a CNCF project that's trying to produce code that's not directly owned by some sort of company or group that's trying to produce a product. I'm trying to think. Can you download? You, you can. Well, you can download things like Kube Control, but I think. Google just takes the responsibility for building that, right? No, it's it's moved off into the the Kubernetes group. They have their own CI CD pipelines. Oh, I realize that. Interesting. Okay. But, but yeah, but they should also be on it should also be on neutral ground. Like it should be should, should be the same thing. Yeah, it, it is, but uh, essentially the Kubernetes group has formed into like a meta company. But that's still under. But that's still under Google, though, isn't it? No, Google gave up the the whole pipeline, and they donated, I think, like five million dollars to run it, and they're just burning through that cash until they're done. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Sergey, your hands up. Yeah, I just want to say that um, not sure about .NET, but for Java at least, um, it's a common thing as well to use bin tray um, and sign artifacts with bin trays um, key which is, of course, a third party key, but at least it's a very well-known um, repository of Java uh, artifacts. And then you can sync to Maven Central through Bintray, um, which can be another option. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we... we... The, the, for me, the question the, for me, the question is, is really, how do we, how do we make sure that customers understand that this is the genuine CNCF SEK bits, because that's ultimately that's ultimately so. So having anything anything that is not not really like the CNCF signing key would be a little odd. And, and maybe I'm taking a very unique .NET perspective. But that's that's how that looks. That's how that looks in, in in our world, right? It's like the the company that is owning the namespace is ultimately the one that is giving you the genuine binary. Mm -hmm. 
So okay, so I'll I'm I'm gonna I'm I have this on my on my homework list, and uh, I'll I'll work with our folks to kind of figure out how to how to get there for .NET and also for Java. Um, but it's so for us it's a, it's an, it's an, it's a it's a real blocker right now. All right, cool. Thank you, Clemens. All right, any, oh, next topic, um, mailing list. So I was asked to see if we can create a mailing list for the SDK, and I did. Here's the URL to it. You can subscribe if you'd like. Um, I think I still need to mention this probably in the individual readmes for each of the SDKs. I think I mentioned it in the, in the main uh, spec repo, but not each individual SDK. So I think that's still an action item I need to follow through on. But I want to make sure you guys are aware of it. We do have an SDK mailing list if you want to subscribe. All right. And I'm not sure who add this, but TCK is the next item on the list. I added it. And uh, if I may, I can quickly explain um, what, what I meant by TCK. So when I was uh, working with uh, cloud events, so Java SDK, I noticed that uh, there are some things that I implemented incorrectly. For example, um, Kafka extension headers, they were missing CA uh, prefix, which means uh, CE pre prefix. Um, and it was there, it was released, um, but nobody had noticed. And SDKs are writing the tests um, themselves in their own code base but it means that they may get it wrong as well. So I was thinking, uh, what if cloud events specification will provide some sort of some, some sort of TCK uh, technology compatibility kit to verify that SDKs are working correctly, and um, it can be so. I haven't thought enough yet. How how can it be designed? But at least I see that for popular transports like Kafka, for example, we could have, um, let's say, pre-populated Docker image with some cloud events in some Kafka topic. And then we read them and we assert um, and compare to some golden values. Scott, did you want to talk about your conformance repo? Because I think that falls into the same general space, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is a uh, conformance test suite that I've been trying to write that's based on mm. reading events composed in YAML and then sending them out to some some transport. Right now it's just HTTP and the thinking was that you would have to uh, bridge to your particular protocol and then uh, consume those events on the other side and then turn it back into HTTP and send it. Uh, there's There's not really a full, like, this is how to make a test <coughs> but the bones are here i'd love uh, help it's written in go it doesn't use any sdk mm -hmm. that's cool i didn't know about it i'll definitely take a look the uh the send functionality is fairly useful i use it a lot and also the the listen is fairly useful too mm -hmm. so it's like if you just you know often people are trying to set up these like funky curls and it, it's a little cumbersome to make a curl call that's cloud events formatted correctly. So cloud events send that does that for you. That's nice. Nice. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely check and there, maybe we'll try to integrate. There's not a lot of like, time code spent in this repo, but uh, if we can make it better, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. And um, Another possibility I considered was to use uh, Oracle's GraalVM, <coughs> uh, which is uh, basically a virtual machine for different languages uh, so that we can reuse uh, the tests uh, in Java, in Golang, in uh, Python, in JavaScript, and in a few other languages um, so that we write them once with uh, GraalVM and then we um, test the SDKs uh, with language-specific constructions um, but the test remains the same. But this yeah, is a bit advanced. Be like a, an integration test only. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if a CLI or, you know, you could interact with it directly in Go, mm -hmm. uh, or you could get the binary built and then use it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, take a look and let me know. I will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Mike, you added something down there? Yeah, so I created a, uh, sorry, making sure I was off mute. Um, I created a Cloud Events SDK in Elixir. 
Um, it has both send and receive functionality uh, working uh, for HTTP. Um, I had a couple of things to do in terms of terms to be a compliant SDK in terms of like getting better examples and making sure we have full test coverage, but um, I wanted to, I don't know, see if there's any initial feedback or advice before I go through that last 80% of the work. <laughs> <laughs> just I, I silly question. What is Elixir? I had no idea. Uh, Elixir is a functional programming language that runs on the Erlang VM. Uh, ah. It's kind of a cross between Ruby and Erlang. Got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, but knowing that like Scott has that conformance uh, repo, that might help me a lot. I've actually been using the Go SDK to test my Elixir SDK. Yeah, that's valid too. But I, I, the the conformance tool is neutral. It's written in Go, and it's it's re using things, but it's it's really just it's very dumb. Um, it doesn't use any other code. Uh, it doesn't mean it's dumb. Well, I mean, I mean, like you could <laughs> you could inject other headers into the outbound requests. Yeah. The okay. idea, the whole idea, is that you string the test in and out using YAML if you flip, like the like YAML. But yeah. Uh, so what is what's the process of getting a new a new SDK merged into the Cloud Events Org? I guess is the the question, larger question I have. Well, we have a very very high bar, and that's you just have to ask. Okay. <laughs> Unless someone, unless someone objects, but as long as there's a good sense that the person's going to be there to support it and not just dump and run, pretty much anybody can get in. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, clean this up and make sure it's conformant and then come back next, uh, I guess, next week to the larger group to ask that question. Sure. Sounds good to me. Anybody have any if questions? You have, if you haven't tried Elixir, it's really fun. Too many languages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Anything else you guys want to talk about? Going once. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. Who is currently working on the Java SDK? I believe that would be Fabio, but let me just double check. Mm -hmm. um, At least according to uh, GitHub, it's definitely Fabio, uh, but I wanted to check whether he's just maintaining it or actively working. I believe he's actively working it, but he does get distracted often. He, he tends to come and go, but I definitely think he is the person to talk to if you need to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Okay. Yep. All right, anything else? All right, we're at the top of the hour. Perfect timing. All right, thank you, everybody. We'll talk again next time. Yep, bye. Bye. Be safe. Thank you. Bye bye. Everybody be safe. Yes. Bye. Yes. See you.